misguide your drug test. Hair testing is six to ten times more effect effective than, than urine testing, but also significantly almost six to ten times more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's advantageous for schools to use the most accurate testing, um, even though the cost is so much higher? I, I would think, I guess going back to what I said a little bit earlier, I think you maybe do the regular screen that is less inexpensive, that is cheaper uh, to do that first round of testing. Then out of that pool, those that test positive, maybe your second screen is that hair. Because you would imagine the number of positives and it would be under 10%, I would imagine, maybe even 5% or less uh, as you do this. And that's just a guess on my part. But at least then you're not screening everybody at that higher rate. It's just the second screen to totally rule out or, or get rid of those false positives uh, might be worth the extra money then because you're dealing with someone's reputation at that standpoint. Yeah, you don't want to screw that up. Yeah. Um, but then obviously it goes back, it tracks back farther. So there is benefits on the first one being a hair test, considering, you know, that three to five days, you know, maybe athletes, especially being more physical, drinking more water, they flush their systems out faster. Mm -hmm. So it's probably closer to that three day mark for most of them. Um, a hair test can go back up to 30 to 90 days. So. Um, you, you don't want to screw them up, but I, I suppose um, the very first test, had it be a hair test, you'd probably be able to find a lot of those troubled students uh, more accurately and, mm -hmm. and easier, even before the season starts, you know. Right, well, and then that's a great point then, too, because then if it was during the summer, uh, prime example, and they're playing a winter sport, if it goes back that far, you know, if you're talking August and then you turn around and you're going for a winter sport in November, if that hair sample goes back that far, then technically were they in violation or were they not? They're they're on their own, they're on summer, and did that, uh, not sticking up for anyone doing any type of drug like that, but then how do you determine the penalty in that case? Because it wasn't done in season or on school grounds, so then what's your case for... Uh, making the argument for punishment uh, in that regard. Uh, so I don't know. I, that'd be a tough one. That's a lot of legal issues there, and I can see a lot of appeals and, and lawsuits being filed for that uh, to have kids be eligible to play uh, with that. So I think, I think still... I guess because then you get into the gray area, you're, you're not paying these students to play the sport. You're not paying them to do anything other than they're just being representatives and getting their education in the school. Uh, I don't think you need to go that extreme of drug testing with the hair following. Now, again, the second, if you want to rule it out just to rule out a false positive, that would have a more definitive. But then you also run the risk, yeah, okay, they go back and find a screen three to four months earlier when they did abuse. Um, I don't know how you would definitely regulate that or, or institute punishment for that. So I guess if you if you did have to do it, you probably have to pick one and stick with it. So whether that would be your your hair samples or just say if if it's possible. Again, I don't know the the scientific studies behind the hair samples. If you look at the hair sample and say anything within the last eight weeks, if it could show that. If I don't know if it's that in depth on the on the test, but if it could show something like that then you can still stick with the hair samples. But if it just shows you sometime in the last three months, it shows you used, it's a little harder of a gray area. But it would support the first test, though, at least. So you don't really punish the kid for, you know, we went back and saw eight weeks later, eight weeks or three months later that you used it. Um, I guess if you went back and just saw, or you tested positive with the urine, the hair backed up that you were positive, so you're going to face the suspension that is applied with your first, second, third offense, whatever it may be. Well, I suppose if instead of thinking of it as a punishment, you work it as um, helping the student. Um, it's not a suspension, but it could be um, 
you know, you, you alert the parents and try to get them, put them in groups that could help them, you know, make better decisions so that doesn't happen again. Right. Um, I think. Um, so, obviously, as a parent of a student athletes, those student athletes had other athlete friends. Um, did you know any parents or other parents that maybe had a child that got in trouble or knew somebody, you know, down the grapevine that was detrimental to that student in the sense of? Um, Maybe they got suspended, never played again, or in any any sort of way, bad rumors. Yeah, we had uh, a couple incidents, and, and I guess that's where it goes back to the schools and the district uh, following policy. Um, numerous times where my son or daughter would come home and say, you know, friend A or B got positive testing. And so immediately, you know, as parents, we ask, okay, well, did they get suspended as per the rules? No, they, they decided to look the other way, and they just got to keep playing. Or they had to sit out. You, you know, usually a rule is you have to sit out so many weeks or miss so many games as part of the suspension, and uh, parents are notified, and you know, they're supposed to go through uh, counseling and things of that nature to, to work through the problem and, and find help for that student. Uh, but on numerous occasions, the, the district we were in, we saw that these students were still allowed to participate. Uh, a prime example, uh, uh, during the football season, uh, three of the players for football were tagged for positive testing. Um, don't know whether it was alcohol or drugs, but they were positive. Uh, this was during summer while they were doing the uh, two-a-day drills and things of that nature, but about a week before the season started. So we thought for sure, well, they're gone for half the season because that's usually the rules with the, the guidebook, and that was not the case. They were... The coach said he would handle the situation, and instead of suspending them for that amount of time because they were three of his starters, they had to run extra laps and suicides during practice for a whole week. Uh, again, uh, as parents on the outside, uh, looking at that didn't show the strong backing of the school district sticking to their policies, uh, basically just making the adjustments for the, depending on the situation. Now, had those kids been bench players that didn't see any time of day, would you be seeing them sitting for the half the season? Of course you probably would have. Uh, but with these being the three-star players and, and the team wanting to do well and win a conference, you saw all three never miss a single game. Uh, and the word gets out. I mean, parents hear that, other other parents hear that, the kids hear that, and it just makes a joke of the system then that, well, why are you testing if you're going to turn out and not hand out the punishment? Uh, or the punishment just depends on if, if, if the parents complain enough or if the uh, students and a star athlete, then then they get special exemptions. Uh, so that's kind of the the tough part, as you do see that is when they do get pop. Because ultimately, the whole reason you're doing the testing is one, you create a level playing field, and then two, the safety of the student themselves. I mean, because they are under 18, they're still developing, they're still you know learning about life and how to be an adult out in the real world, and what are you showing them that just by that example, you're showing them that they can still do that kind of stuff and not be punished. Mm. And when they're young and still have parents and teachers to help them through situations like this, that's the worst thing you could do at all is just let them know they can skate. So then they're going to think that way the rest of life. They'll be out on their own, and it's going to be a lot harder in the real world when that happens, and, and then they're put away, locked up in jail or, or something like that. Well, one of the most famous cases, Josh Gordon said, ever since high school, they kind of just... He was so good, they didn't really care, and you've seen that carry throughout his life, and right. now where he is now, um, jobless. 
Okay. Which is unfortunate. Um, going back, so it seems that every school has its own set of rules, <laughs> which almost makes it, um, I suppose, unfair. So if, you know, in the same division, one school decides that, you know what, we're going to stick to our guns, we're going to suspend our star player, and the other division says, or other team in the division says, you just have to run another lap, it would seem maybe it would be more effective if these were league rules, mm -hmm. and every school was required to do it for athletes. But then at that point, then you get in the argument of who institutes the testing. It, you know, you can't just pick, oh, our school athletic trainer will do the testing or because then let's say the tester they're not giving heads up ahead of time they don't you know because then you run that risk you can't you won't be random anymore because then coaches will know because they'll have to be notified you have some neutral tester okay we're going to be in your school next tuesday through thursday doing testing well then they're all going to give the heads up to their their kids that uh, the testing is going to happen and the kids can take the necessary steps to to avoid that so I, I don't know. It's a, I agree with you. You got to find a way to create a level playing field there because there are that instances occurred through my both my kids' uh, careers as we've gone to games. Some teams that the coach sticks by the rules, those kids are out. Uh, we had one where basketball season they had to sit three kids because they got busted. Uh, so those three kids didn't play for the first half of the season, and their record reflected that. But the coach stuck to his guns, whereas otherwise you have teams that, you know have one or two kids test positive and they're still out there playing the next night so mm -hmm. it, you're right you got to find a way to, to if you're going to do it but then again your ultimate goal is are you looking to make the playing field fair more or are you looking for the safety of the children more so if you're looking for the safety of the kids more i guess you know as long as they're getting the help if the punishment isn't there then the key is they're getting the help but if you're looking at it more from an athletic standpoint um, then you want to create a level playing field. Those it should be across the board, district wide, and those results should be public, published to someone within the district that would account for all of that. And depending on the sport, even though you, you you weigh the benefit on the student, I suppose. But for instance, you got your star receiver who hasn't done anything wrong, and he's hoping for a scholarship to go to college. Now the quarterback suspended for half the season. And that's going to affect, you know, other parts of the team. Well, that's interesting because we had that actually happen, not as a parent here, but uh, working uh, in Medina. That happened one season in Medina. The, the, you brought up that scenario. The quarterback, unfortunately, went to a party and got caught uh, and had to face the, the penalties and was suspended for half the season. So... He missed his first uh, five games of the season out of a 10-game season. So, yeah, there were a lot of other players that were hoping on that quarterback to be there to help elevate them, whether it was an offensive lineman, a running back, wide receiver. But as a whole, the coach handled it well, and the teammates understood it. Uh, the player even took accountability for his actions and spoke to the team, uh, expressed his apology. So it was a, it was a nice way to look at the growth factor that that's that's a case where a student learned their lesson and and grew up as a, as a man because it was it was on the boy side of the football that he stood up for it stood up for his actions and apologized to his teammates apologized to the coaches and moved forward in, with his life and the team supported him so you didn't have that turmoil or, or oh man there goes my scholarship because he didn't show up I mean, they still can go out and get their numbers with the backup quarterback or, or what have you, but uh, I think the, the better thing was showing that the kid uh, took his penalty, did his time, and the teammates all around that saw that as well, and how he handled himself during that time uh, was a big inspiration for all the other kids as well. So that, I think that's the goal you're looking for with why you have this testing. And you hope. You know, it happens one time and, and the team realizes that, hey, we are a team, mm -hmm. you know, so next time there's pressure, maybe they'll all be like, hey, I'm not doing it. You can't do it either because, right. you know, you're going to you're going to screw me up yeah. in my future. You're gonna, you know, so it's pure pressure in the positive way. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden you've got all these guys saying, hey, you know, there's 60 of us on this football team. We're all here at this party. You you better put that down now because 
you know, we've got a season to look forward to here, and you're, I'm not going to have you blow up for the rest of us. So that it's kind of that reverse peer pressure, where then you have kids doing that, and and that's another positive with having this testing there. So I mean, there there are the pros and cons with this, and it's going to continue to be that way, um, and especially with the ever changing society, with certain drugs becoming legal and and not as frowned upon, uh, and what happens in the home is you know technically within any parents or family's rights of what they do whether that be having a casual glass of wine at dinner or if they're you know smoking or partaking in something that's their right within their own household but yeah so i don't know it's going to be a fine line and, and trying to find that balance uh within districts and, and communities it will be a, is a tough one it will be a battle that will continue uh, for years to come